Well, hello everyone. This is Dr. Mark Tinsley. I want to welcome you to English 111. Uh, this is English Composition 1. I will be your professor this semester. Unfortunately, we're going to have to do this online. Uh, as you know, COVID-19 has restricted our on-campus attendance, and so we are doing the majority, the vast majority of our courses at CVCC in an online format, and that includes English 111. Now, this may not be an ideal circumstance for most people, but let's bear with it. Let's do our best. Let's have an optimistic attitude, and let's roll into this, uh, because I think you'll find that we can teach English composition. We can learn how to write even in an online format like this. And we're going to do our best. I'm going to do my best to present this material to you. And if you do your best to absorb the material, think about it critically, um, practice the things that I ask you to practice, and do your best on your papers, I think you'll find that uh, you can learn a lot and grow a lot in this class. And I hope you'll have that attitude, uh, because I certainly have it, and I am excited to be here with you this semester. And again, English 111, College Composition, Central Virginia Community College. Let's get started, all right? Today I want to do an introduction and a grammar review. Now, the grammar review is going to be very, very uh, brief. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. If you have any questions on anything throughout the semester, including the grammar review or introduction material today, please feel free to give me, uh, send me an email or, or give me a call. And my email address and phone number are found in the syllabus. And uh, we'll be talking about that here very briefly, or momentarily, I should say. All right? All right. Well, let's get going. Uh, a little bit about me. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Tinsley. I have uh, oh, over 12 years of higher education experience. I've been both a teacher and an administrator all the way through the level of dean uh, at, a, at a major university. Uh, I do teach as an adjunct, part-time professor here at Central Virginia Community College, and have been doing that for about 10 years now. I actually have uh, been teaching longer than that, but I took a little bit of a two-year break from CVCC. So I would have been teaching at CVCC over 12 years, uh, but I took about a two-year break. So I've been teaching at CVCC about 10 years. Uh, I am a local church pastor. I do own a small business. Um, I am currently the president of a small nonprofit, but uh, that's probably going to end here soon. Uh, I am a military chaplain. I serve in the United States Army Reserve at the present time. And uh, I am a husband and the father of five children, ranging from ages 15 down to five. And so, a large family there. Some of you are probably from large families. Some of you are probably even from larger families than that. Maybe you have more than four or five siblings, but uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. I love teaching. I love students. I love being a part of the educational endeavor, and I want to help you. And so if you need anything, I'll reiterate this numerous times throughout the semester, if you need anything during the course of this course, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I am approachable. I'm a person who wants to help you, and, uh, and we'll do what we have to to get you the assistance that you need and desire, okay? What I need you to do right now is to download a copy of your syllabus. Now, you can print it out, and we'll walk through it together, or you can pull it up on your screen, whatever you want to do. I'm not going to project it here uh, on this presentation, but if you'll follow along on your syllabus, we'll be on the same sheet, because I have the same syllabus in front of me that you have in front of you if you download it right now. Okay, so if you need to pause this, go ahead and do so. And uh, start it back up again when you have your syllabus, okay? All right, again, Central Virginia, I'm going down page one. Central Virginia Community College, we're part of the Department of Arts and Sciences. This is English 111, College Composition 1. This is the fall 2020 semester. We are doing this online. You see my name there and my credentials, my email address, phone number, and I am available to you by appointment. Just send me an email or give me a call, okay? We can make it happen. You'll see the course description there. I'm not going to read it to you. We'll talk about the course objectives here in a minute. Uh, this is an English composition class, so you can imagine we're going to be writing papers and learning how to write papers. You'll see your prerequisites. Most of you should have, all of you should have these prerequisites completed, or you would not have been enrolled in this class. Now, big question is, what textbook do we need? Now, many of you are, probably already have this textbook, but if you don't, it's uh, the Lunsford textbook there, Everything's an Argument from New York Macmillan, 2018 or 8th edition. 
Uh, you see the ISBN there. It's an easy book to find. Uh, the bookstore should have it if you need it, or you can buy it from any other distributors out there. Okay. The materials that we need for learning, obviously, are Microsoft Word. You're going to be doing your papers in Microsoft Word. You need the textbook and something to take notes. I would encourage you to take notes as you listen to these lectures. We're going to be listening to these each and every um, week. You're going to be listening to me. And uh, I would encourage you to take notes as you're listening, okay? We'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a moment. Now, bottom of page one, we're looking at course objectives. And if you move from page one to page two, you'll see that we have two main goals. And I'm, I'm just going to hit on them. I'm not going to read all of this to you verbatim. But our two main goals are to learn how to write, the process of writing, and two, to learn how to critically think. Folks, those are the two things that I want to do this semester with you. I want you to learn how to write, obviously. This is an English composition class. But maybe even more than that, I want you to learn how to critically think, how to take information, analyze it, logically and reasonably to come up with solutions that make sense. That's called critical thinking. I want you to be able to do that. I want you to make, be able to make good decisions and analyze well. Okay, So those are the two things we're going to do. You can read the, the sub points under each one of those two goals, but that is what we are all about. Uh, on the bottom of page two, you'll, st you'll see the student learning outcomes. I'm not going to read those to you, but you can read those at your leisure. Uh, basically, these are around writing and critical thinking, as you can imagine. All right, the one thing on page three, middle, middle of the page there, that we need to talk about is the major essay submission policy. This is a departmental policy that we have to abide by as teachers. Let me read this to you verbatim. We'll talk about it because it's very important. To be eligible for passing grade in English 111 and English 112, students must meet the following VCCS, Virginia Community College System, and CVCC English Department criteria. One, the students in English 111 must produce a minimum of 15, 15 to 20 pages of finished graded text per course. Folks, you have to, at the end of this course, have 15 to 20 pages of written work. If I can't total up 15 to 20 pages, then technically I can't pass you. So you need to make sure that you follow. If you follow the minimum page requirements on each one of our assignments, you will have no problem meeting that criteria. If you're one of these people, though, that likes to not do, not meet the standards when it comes to page criteria, you may not meet it. And then I would have to... Um, give you a failing grade for this course. I do not want to do that, please. I, have, I find zero satisfaction in failing students. So please, let's not even go there. Just meet your minimum page requirements and you will be fine. Point number two, students must compose three to five. We will do actually four major essays in this class that present and support a thesis or claim totaling a minimum of 15 to 20 pages of graded text uh, in English 111. Individual instructors are responsible for clearly designating the syllabus which essays qualify as major essays. All of our essays will be major essays in this class. Okay. Third bullet point. Students who fail to submit any major es essay uh, within the time period allotted by the instructor, assigned due date plus late submission allowance, prior to the 10-week withdrawal date may be withdrawn from the course at the instructor's discretion. In other words, if you don't submit your major essay by the withdrawal date of, the, uh, of this uh, semester, then I can uh, withdraw you from the course. And uh, I don't want to do that, so just stay up with your work. Next point. Students who fail to submit any major essay within the time period allotted by the instructor assigned due date plus late submission allowance after the 10-week withdrawal may, a date may fail the course at the, at the instructor's discretion. So what that means is after the withdrawal date passes, if you don't submit a major essay, I have the option of failing you for the course. It used to be that we had to fail the students for the course. Now I have the option of doing that. Let me tell you something, though. If you don't complete the papers in this class, you will fail the class, okay? Because uh, the papers weigh a lot in this class, as you will see, uh, and, and failure, to, failure to do one will probably result in failure for the class. So, again... Let's not go there. Just do your assignments and you will be fine. Okay. Last bullet there for English 111 composition courses. Uh, the final or next to final essay, the one potentially submitted for the big read, must be researched argument essay of at least a thousand words on a topic pertaining to civic literacy. So we will do that if you follow my guidelines. Again, I'm not going to lead you astray. If you follow my guidelines for the course, you will be doing all of these things and you will do them well and uh 
within the parameters, okay? Again, if you have any questions about that, please let me know. I'm glad, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, here's the big question people have. What do I have to do in this course? What are my assignments going to be? And that's what we find at the bottom of page three of the syllabus. First of all, reading. Students complete the assigned readings in the textbook. I expect that to be done. You will get quizzes over those readings. We'll talk about those in a minute. Discussion boards. Student will participate in four discussion board assignments on topics posted by the instructor. Instruction will be posted on Canvas for each topic assignment. The discussion board assignments will count for 10% of the student's final grade. That means 2.5% for each one of the four discussion boards. Uh, folks, uh, these discussion boards are not hard. You just need to do them and participate with the class, and you will be fine, okay? The essays, this is the major assignments that are going to be uh, for the class. <clears throat> four major essays will be assigned for the course. Uh, each will be an argumentative essay, where a thesis is clearly articulated and supported. The essays will deal with the following topics. And you can see the topics that we're going to do for the four essays there. I may tweak these a little bit as we go along, so just follow my direction, follow my lead as we go on in the course. But those are generally what we're going to do. You'll see down there about midway down page four that it says final essays will be submitted via Canvas. Rough drafts of each essay, however, will be accepted the week prior to the final draft uh, for voluntary review and will be turned in via Canvas. In other words, what I'm saying is when you turn in your final essay, it's going to be turned in via Canvas, Canvas as a Word document. And we'll talk more about that as we get to that first essay. However, the week prior to that final submission, I will be calling for rough drafts. Now, you're not required to turn in a rough draft in this class. But if you want to turn it in so I can give you a, a quick review of it and maybe give you some guidance, uh, you're more than happy to. I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. I want to do that, and you'll get a few little extra credit points if you do that. It's not much, but a little bit. Um, again, down a little bit from that. Final essays submitted late will receive a 10% deduction for each day they are late. After three days, the essay will receive a grade of F. So, don't be late. Turn your essays in on time, and you won't have to worry about that. Okay. A little bit past midway on page four, we talk about quizzes. Quizzes will be given periodically throughout the course. These quizzes will be based on the material assigned in the course textbook. Uh, questions on the quizzes will be multiple choice, true, false, and or fill in the blank. Quizzes will be administered via Canvas and will count 20% of the final grade. Not each quiz, but the, all eight will actually take eight quizzes in this course. Those eight quizzes will count towards 20% of your final grade. So that's a significant amount. That's two letter grades. So make sure you do those quizzes. They're open book, so there's no reason why you can't score very well on them. Uh, but every semester I have students that don't do the quizzes for some reason. I've never understood that. Uh, don't be one of those students because that's going to dramatically harm your grade. Okay, you'll see that the, how the grades are weighted down there at the bottom of page 4. Essays are worth 70% of your final grade. Quizzes 20% and discussion boards 10%. We do work on a 10-point scale, so 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 89 is a B, and so on and so forth. You can read about the early alerts at the bottom of page 4. Move to page 5. Academic honesty is big in this course. In this course, any assignment that contains verifiable instances of plagiarism or academic dishonesty may automatically receive a grade of zero and will not be eligible for any type of revision, rewrite, do-over, or makeup. So please don't plagiarize. Do your own work and you'll be fine. We will talk about plagiarism in this class in one of our lectures um, and uh, define it and, and describe what it is and how to avoid it. Uh, but I think most of us know what it is, right? If we don't do our own work, if we copy someone else's work, that is plagiarism. So let's avoid that and uh, we'll be good to go. Students with disabilities, about halfway down on page 5. If you have a disability and need... Uh, uh, an accommodation, please don't be afraid. Go to the call, contact our uh, Students with Disabilities office, get in there, get your accommodation, give it to me. Let's make it right for you so that uh, you have the best opportunity to, to get the, the highest grade possible in this class and to learn as much as you can. Okay, it'll just be between you and me and the, and the Disabilities office, so don't worry about it. Go get your accommodation, bring it to me, and we'll be fine. All right, Title IX. We shouldn't have any Title IX issues since we're online, but let's just talk about it briefly. Title IX protects you, the student, and me, the professor, from any fear of sexual um, misconduct in the classroom. Now, we can have sexual misconduct over online, and if I see it, I'm going to tell you right now, if I see it in discussion boards or emails or anything, I'm going to call it out, and I'm going to call this Title IX office 
and we're going to have to take care of it. We don't. We take Title IX very, very seriously. It's a federal guideline, and um, put out by the U.S. Department of Education, it's Office of Civil Rights. And uh, folks, again, you know, keep your comments above board. If you're making sexually suggestive um, uh, statements, if you're abusing your fellow students or f anyone at the at the college in any way. Uh, you're in you're in violation of Title IX of the Civil Rights um, section of the uh, U.S. Department of Education, and so we have to take care of that. It has to be investigated, and it has to be uh, acted upon if need be. So, don't even go there. Again, keep yourself above board. I take it very seriously. So if I see it, I'm gonna call it out every time. Okay. You can read the COVID-19 statement there at the bottom of page five. Moving on to page six is our weekly schedule. This is what we'll be following. We are now in the first week there, August 24th through the 30th. Course introduction, grammar review. You'll see how you read this. You read it across. It tells you the third column tells you what you're supposed to read for that week. There's nothing to read this week. Fourth column tells you what assignments are due this week. Uh, it says no assignments due. I need to correct that. You do have a discussion board this week, so make sure that you do... Uh, do complete the discussion board. That is a mistake on your syllabus, and I will try to get that corrected. You'll see the important dates there at the bottom of page 6, and that concludes the syllabus review. Now, this in the class, this is where I'd say, anybody have any questions? And several people would probably raise their hands and ask questions. We can't do that. So if you have a question, please send me an email uh, or give me a call and we can talk through it. No problem whatsoever. I am happy to assist. All right. All right. Well, <clears throat> let me talk briefly about how we're going to operate in this class and then we'll jump into our, our review of grammar. Each module you'll see you have three basic headers. Read, listen, and do. Those are three things that you have to do each week. Read, listen, and do. Read is what you need to read in your textbook. Listen is what you need to listen to, these, these lectures. I'll have a lecture or two each, or maybe something else that you need to listen to under the listen section. So read, listen, and then do are the assignments that you have to do for that week. If you go through the read, listen, and do sections, and you do everything that's in each one of those sections, you're going to be golden in this class. You're not going to have any problems. I've tried to keep things at a reasonable level, so you, you shouldn't have too much read, listen, and or do uh, in any given week that you can't get it done, even if you have multiple classes. I'm a very reasonable instructor, okay? I want you to know that. Um, I, I, I realize that life happens. I realize that we have to, uh, that life gets busy sometimes, and things get difficult at times for whatever reason. If you run into obstacles, just reach out to me. It's not a big deal. I am here to help you in any way I can. So, you know, use me. Don't abuse me, <laughs> but use me. Uh, as your teacher, use me as a source of, of help and information for you. I'm more than happy and want to help, okay? All right. I think there's enough said about that. Let's move on to a grammar review. So let's talk about sentences, clauses, and phrases. Now, I'm going to move through this stuff pretty quickly because I'm assuming that most of you have a good, solid foundation in basic grammar and syntax. But in case you don't, here's a review. Uh, and in case you need a primer to kind of get your mind going and get you jump-started for writing, here we go. Sentences involve subjects and predicates, right? And a subject is the actor of a sentence, and a predicate is the action. So you have to have an actor and an action. The other part of a sentence, <clears throat> not every sentence has to have this, but most sentences also have direct object. Who is acted upon? So you have an actor, the action, and the person acted upon. And those are called subjects, predicates, and direct objects. Okay? But a sentence at a minimum has to have a subject and a pre predicate, an actor and an action. Now, clauses are, are, are sort of like sentences. They have a subject and a predicate. There are independent clauses and subordinate clauses. Um, independent clauses stand alone, right? You get to the end of an independent clause and you have no questions. The dog is brown. Boom. I got it. The dog, the actor, is the action. He's brown. And brown is an adjective in this case. So we, we got it. We, we got to, we're dealing with a brown dog. No questions. Got it. A subordinate clause, however, is a, is a, is a clause that leads you, leaves you with a little bit of a question. Since the dog is brown. Now, at the end of that clause, I think, since the dog. Since the dog is what? I mean, since what? I mean, it leaves me with a question like, 
the sentence is left hanging, right? Since the dog is brown and you think dot, 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 okay, what? Since the dog is brown, what? So it still has a subject, the dog, and a verb, a predicate is. So it's still a clause, subject and predicate, but it leaves us with a question. It's subordinate to something else, which is why we call it a subordinate clause. Phrases different from cl differ from clauses because they don't have a subject and or a predicate. So, for example, is. Is is a verb, so it's a predicate, but there's no subject, right? So is standing alone is what we would call a phrase, or what about? Well, what about what? What about doesn't have a verb. What about really doesn't even have a subject. Um, so no subject, no predicate, it's a phrase. Jane. Jane is a subject. But there's no predicate. So you see how it goes, uh, hopefully. Sentences have subject and predicates. Clauses have subject and predicates. They can be independent or subordinate. And phrases are missing either a subject or a predicate or both. There are eight basic parts of speech. You probably know this from way back in elementary school. Nouns, pronouns, adjectives, verbs, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, and interjections. And we're going to talk about each one of these in turn. Let's talk about nouns first. We all know nouns are persons, places, or things, right? There are proper nouns, which are proper names, basically. Matthew, United States of America. These are the nouns that are usually capitalized, right? Uh, they speak to exact things, persons, places, or things. Common nouns, however, are, are more general. So we talk about a dog, clinic, house. Uh, these are still specific things, but they're not particular in other words, we're not talking about a particular dog. Well, maybe we are, but we don't name that dog. Or we might we're not we might be talking about a particular clinic, but we don't name that clinic, right? Uh, concrete nouns are things that we can touch and experience with our senses: the car, wind, or odor, right? Uh, abstract nouns are things that we really can't experience with our senses, but they are still nouns. Like anger, anger is a noun, but we don't really feel it. I mean, we feel it with our emotions, but we can't feel it with our hands, right? Now, persistence, forthrightness, you get it. These We don't experience these with our major senses, but they're still nouns. They're still things, as it were. Then there are countable nouns. Now, there are a lot of overlap with these nouns. Like a countable noun can also be a concrete noun, right? So countable nouns are things that we can actually count. So I can count the number of guitars, or I can count the number of roadways that I'm talking about, or I can count the number of airplanes that I'm talking about. Whereas non-countable nouns are things that I really can't count. I can't count anger. How many angers do you have, right? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, how many winds do you have? Uh, how many odors do you have? I mean, these are things that really we can't count. Uh, and then collective nouns are nouns that are, are singular but really stand for multiple people, places, or things. For example, if I talk about a board... I'm usually talking about a board of directors, which means I'm talking about a group of people, right? A group of people. Or if I say the police, I'm usually not talking about, when I say the police, I'm talking about the police department, which is made up of multiple police officers, non-sworn officers, and staff, right? Or if I say a team, a team is made up of multiple people. So I think you get the idea. The collective nouns are singular, but talk about, have, but have an underlying plurality to them, Okay. I hope these make sense, and I know I've gone through these quickly. And if you have any questions, again, hit me up. That's what I'm here for. Okay, now this is real easy. How do you make a noun plural? And everybody knows you add S or ES to the end of most nouns to make them plural, right? So we take dog, dog goes to dogs. Lunch, add ES, goes to lunches. And we all know this. You go, my goodness, Professor, are you really teaching us this? And the answer is yes, because we always have the irregular plural forms, right? This is where it becomes difficult. Because sometimes uh, plurality is not as easy as adding S or ES. For example, bunny goes to bunnies, but it's not just adding an ES. It's actually changing the Y to an I and then adding ES. And you ask, well, why do we do that? And the answer is convention. Um, language is odd, especially the English language. And how it's derived over time is very complex. And so these irregular plural forms, we've just got to kind of know them. You say, well, how do I get to know the multi multitude of irregular plural forms? And the answer is read. <laughs> the more you read and the more you write, the more you're going to encounter these irregular forms and learn them. Uh, people who are avid readers, oftentimes, uh, they, this is easy stuff. They get this. Those of you maybe who don't read much, this, this might be a little more difficult. Um, but as you read more and as you write more, this will become much, much more, uh, much easier. 
syllabus becomes syllabi. We don't even add an S or ES. We actually take the US off and add an I. It's a Latin thing. Uh, wife doesn't become wife's. It becomes wives. We change the F-E to V-E-S. Goose becomes geese. Uh, deer doesn't even change. Plural of deer is deer. And, uh, and then thesis becomes theses when we pluralize it. So, yeah, irregular forms. How do you know them? You learn them through experience. Let's talk about pronouns. We know that pronouns stand in place of a noun. There are different types of pronouns, and I'm going to go through these very quickly. By the way, I'm not expecting you to be able to regurgitate all of this stuff. I mean, this is just a primer, okay? I'm not going to necessarily test you on any of this. I mean, you'll be indirectly tested when you write your papers, but I'm not going to have a test where I go, okay, now give me an example of an objective personal pronoun. I won't do that to you, all right? But let's talk about what subjective personal pronouns are. Subjective personal pronouns are personal pronouns that stand in the subject of the sentence. So, I, she, we, they. I went, she goes, uh, we have, they are. Notice that those are in the subject, when we talk about sentence, subject and predicate, right? Subjective personal pronouns are pronouns that are in the subject of the sentence. Objective personal pronouns are pronouns that are in the direct object part of the sentence. So, she went with him, right? With him, him is the direct object. And you can see there, objective personal pronouns are him, me, us, and those. Uh, objective personal pronouns and subjective personal pronouns are different. I is a subjective personal pronoun. Me is an objective personal pronoun. Uh, she, subjective personal pronoun. Her, objective personal pronoun. He, subjective. Him, objective. We, subjective. Us, objective. Okay, so you can always pull these out because they're easy to identify because they're different. Possessive personal pronouns, we know these. Mine, that's mine. Those are ours. Uh, they are theirs. Uh, these show possession, who owns them. Reflexive personal pronouns are easy to identify because they have the word self at the end of them. Myself, her, yourself, himself. These reflect back on the subject usually. Uh, interrogative pronouns, they interrogate. They ask questions. That's what interrogate means. They ask questions. What? Which? Whose? Who? All right. Those are pronouns. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's... The uh, question word, the interrogative at the beginning of a question, whose is it? Who are you? What is that? Those are actually pronouns. They stand in place of a person, place, or a thing. Right? Demonstrative pronouns uh, demonstrate. I, I wish I could. you could see me because I'm moving my arms right now and saying that over there. So I'm pointing at the wall. That over there. I'm, de I'm demonstrating, right? That. I'm looking at that over there. I'm demonstrating with my arm. Uh, those, I'm demonstrating with my arms again and pointing at something. This, I'm holding it close to me going, look at this. This, this is my notebook. This is my pen. Um, uh, I'm demonstrating through a pronoun, use, use of a pronoun. And then an indefinite pronoun uh, just speaks to a person, place, or a thing, but very indefinite. We don't know what person, place, or a thing. So everyone, anyone, somebody. I'm not being specific. All right, everybody got it? If not, shoot me a question. Let's talk about adjectives. Adjectives describe a noun, right? There's two types, attributive adjectives and predicative adjectives. Attributive adjectives are adjectives that are found right next to the noun. So if we say red car or ugly duckling, the red and the ugly are describing the nouns that they're, st that they're sitting right beside. It's a red car, an ugly duckling. Predicative adjectives are a little bit different in that usually a verb separates the noun and the adjective. Mother was angry. Now, angry is still an adjective describing mother, which is a noun, but it's separated by the verb was, just like the car is blue. Blue is an adjective describing the car, but it's separated by the verb to be, which is is. All right. All right. Articles. This is easy. Two types of articles, definite and indefinite. The definite article is the, the car, the person. When I use the definite article, I'm usually talking about a specific person, place, or a thing, a specific noun. So if I say the car, I'm talking about a particular car, or the person. I'm usually talking about 
a particular person. Whereas with indefinite pronouns, a or an, I'm usually talking about, I, I, I can be talking about a specific thing, but oftentimes I'm talking about a, a general th- person, place, or thing. I'm talking about a smartphone. I'm not talking about a particular smartphone. Just give me a smartphone. Or I'm talking about a teammate. Um, I had a teammate. Now, I could be talking about, again, I could be talking about a specific teammate, but oftentimes when I use the indefinite article, I'm not talking about a specific person, place, or thing, but I'm being more general. Voibs. All right, let's talk about verbs. We all know what verbs do. They demonstrate action. There's transitive, intransitive, and incomplete verbs. We won't talk about those. Let's talk about transitive and intransitive verbs. Transitive verbs are when the action is taken on the direct object. And you use the what test for this. Let me show you what I mean. He ate the potato. He ate. What did he eat? There's the what test. He ate. What did he eat? The potato. You see how that? Then the direct object is the potato. We talked about it. So the subject is he. Ate is the predicate or the verb. The potato is the direct object. So he ate. What did he eat? The potato. You see how the action, the eating, is done on the direct object. That's a transitive verb. You can think about it as... The action is translating through the verb from the subject to the direct object. So see how if you could draw an arrow between he and the potato, the action goes right through eight, right? In transitive verbs, though, the action remains with the verb itself. So the plant wilts. You still use the what test. What wilts? The plant. Notice how we take a the, that little arrow takes a U-turn, doesn't it? The plant. What wilts? What wilts? Urch. Turns around and goes right back to the subject. The plant. The plant wilts. The action doesn't translate tra- transition to an direct object, but goes right back to the verb itself. That's called an intransitive verb. Verbs have a voice. You've probably heard of active voice versus passive voice. I want to talk about that for a few minutes. Um, active voice is when the subject performs the action. So Jack skipped the rock. Now, in this you perform what I call, it's not, I don't think it's on here anywhere. No, it's not. You perform what's called the who test, all right? Jack skipped the rock. Who skipped the rock? Jack. And Jack is the subject of that sentence. So active voice, the subject performs the action. Everybody see that? Who skipped? Jack. And Jack is right there in the position of the, skip, uh, the subject. The girl ate the cereal. Who ate the cereal? The girl. And she's right there in the place of the subject. So this is active voice. It's very clear. It's very succinct. There's no question what's going on. Jack skipped the rock. The girl ate the cereal. Passive voice, however, is a little bit more difficult. But the subject is acted upon in passive voice. Look, for example, the man was accosted by the woman. That's a a kind of a confusing question because as soon as we see was accosted, we want to say, who did the accosting? The man. But if you read the sentence, it's not the man. The man is in the subject position because the man was, right? So the man is sitting in the subject position of that sentence, but he's not the subject. He's actually the one acted upon. The man was accosted. Who did the accosting? Look at it. It's the woman. He was accosted by the woman. So if we want to make that active, the easier way to say that sentence and the less confusing way is to say the woman accosted the man. Now you've made it active because now the woman is the subject and also the actor, the one who does the action on the direct object. Does everybody see that? I hope you do. Let's look at another one. The dog was washed by the man. Again, the dog is sitting in the subject position of the sentence, but he's not the one who does the washing. He's really the direct object. The one who does the washing, the real subject of the sentence, is the man. So let's write that in an active voice. We would say the man washed the dog. And in writing, you, in most any kind of writing, you want to write in active voice as much as possible because it's less confusing, it's more direct, it's more succinct, and it gets to your point. Okay? I know we're going fast. Hang in there. Tenses. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We know past, present, and future tense, right? <clears throat> so I'm not going to go over those. I think we all know what past tense of a verb is, a present tense, and a future tense. The, the, the last three, though, can be different, uh, difficult. Perfect, pluperfect, and future perfect. Let's just say for the purposes of this le- lecture that perfect, pluperfect, and future perfect are easy to identify with because of the other words that are found with them. If you have uh, the verb has, 
with a past tense verb beside it. So has worked, has lived, has sought, has seen. You're dealing with the perfect tense. Okay? Okay? Pluperfect, had walked, had seen, had heard. So we got the past tense, walked, seen, and heard. But you also have this word had. Okay? And that's pluperfect. And future perfect, will have been or shall have been. Shall have or will have precedes the past tense. That's your uh, future perfect tense. I'm not going to go into any more detail on these because in an online format like this, these can be very difficult, and we're covering so much today. And plus, I'm not testing you on this. So if you want to know more about those tenses, please contact me. I'm more than happy to talk to you about them. Let's talk about adverbs. Now, everybody says adverbs modify verbs, and that is true, but they can also modify adjectives, clauses, or other adverbs. Let's talk about examples. Modifying verbs is the easy one. The boy jumped high. High describes how high, the, the height that the boy jumped. So it's, it's a description of the verb jumped. The boy jumped. How did he jump? He jumped high. We all get that. That's the common use of an adverb. But what about adjectives? Okay, the very tall boy ate pies. Now, the boy is the sentence, is the uh, is a noun, right? Tall is an adjective. So he's a boy, he's a tall boy. Very describes that adjective. It modifies that adjective and says he's not just tall. He's very tall, All right? So in this case, very is an adverb modifying an adjective. Modifying clauses. Oddly, I feel fine. I feel fine as a clause. It has a subject. It has a predicate. Um, oddly is just kind of added in there to, to modify that clause and give you the feeling that, well, maybe I shouldn't feel fine, but oddly I do, right? So that's a modification of a clause. We can also modify other adverbs. Uh, frankly, I am tired. Frankly, again, modifies the clause, I am tired. Quite modifies frankly itself. Right? So quite frankly. Two adverbs right side by side. Adverbs answer questions regarding when, where, and how. Let's talk about prepositions. They link nouns and pronouns to objects in a sentence. Uh, they usually deal with some sort of space or time relationship. For example, we've all, we all know prepositions. They're words like above, beyond, under, in, with, between, beside, through, etc. For example, the ball is under the porch. Under is a preposition. It describes a spatial relationship. The dog ran in the building. Again, in is the preposition. It describes a spatial relationship. Sarah is beside the car. Beside is the preposition. Now you say, well, why do you have the... Uh, those phrases under the porch, in the building, and beside the car underlined. Because those are what we call, and some of you have already guessed it, prepositional phrases. Phrases that are led or introduced by a preposition. Okay. The ball is under the porch. So the ball, subject, is verb, under the porch. Under is preposition. The porch is a direct object. Okay. All right, conjunction, junction. What's your function? Let's talk about conjunctions. They're words that join. They, well, they're, they're words that join words, groups of words, or clauses and phrases. Two types: coordinating conjunctions and subordinating conjunctions. Coordinating conjunctions are words like and, but, either, or, neither, nor. They join items of equal importance. For example, I am a teacher, comma, and conjunction. I work at CBCC. I am a teacher. And I work at CVCC. Both of those are sentences. And I'm joining those two sentences by the conjunction and. And it's therefore, it's a coordinated conjunction because I'm joining two complete sentences. The sentences are, I am a teacher. The second sentence is, I work at CVCC. So but since those are two equal sentences, they're joined by a coordinating conjunction. Uh, if you have two, um, two nouns, Fran and Sarah. And is connecting Fran, the word Fran, and then the word Sarah. Those are two equal people, so that's a coordinating conjunction. Subordinating conjunctions are words like that, as, when, where, unless, since, etc., things like that. They join items of unequal importance. 
For example, when I go, I usually buy groceries. When is the subordinating conjunction there? Because when I go, um, or I go, is kind of a confusing sentence. Now, I usually buy groceries is pretty clear, but I go is kind of confusing. So those two sentences are not really uh, equal. And so when you use the subordinating conjunction, when I go, um, it's connecting two things of unequal importance, right? Um, and we'll get to some other examples later down the road, but I hope that's as clear as mud. Interjections, I call these throwaway words. They use, usually, they're usually used to express emotion. Well, I don't know. Well, the word well is not necessary, right? You could just say, I don't know. Or, oh, my stars, you look so different. Again, you look so different is all you need to say. But, oh, my stars just adds that emotion. It's called an interjection. Or even the, the singular th word, wow, interjection. It's not necessary. We try to avoid interjections in academic writing, by the way. So I shouldn't see a lot of these in your papers. <laughs> All right. Okay, now I'm not going to ask you to turn these practical exercises in. Let me say that again. You do not have to turn in these practical exercises, but I would encourage you to go through and do them. So take out a piece of paper, write three complete sentences to describe something you did this summer. In each of those sentences, be sure that you use a subject and a predicate, okay? Uh, in your three sentences, use the following at least once. Use an adjective, use an adverb, use a preposition, a conjunction, a noun, and a pronoun. All right. You can pause the tape here. I say the tape. You can tell I'm an older guy, right? You can pause the recording here <laughs> or, or keep going. But uh, pause it here if you'd like. Do the practical exercise and then hit play again when you're ready to go. All right, what's the problem with these sentences? Ate a big cheeseburger yesterday. No subject, right? We've got a predicate, ate a big cheeseburger yesterday. Got a verb, ate, but we don't have a subject. We need a person, a place, or a thing, right? We need Bob ate a big cheeseburger yesterday. Or I ate a big cheeseburger yesterday. All right, second one. Fran and her dog. What's wrong with this? You got it. No predicate. We've got subjects, Fran and her dog, but no predicate. All right, what part of speech are we dealing here with here? Frankie is going to school. Frankie is what? Frankie is a noun, right? Everybody get that? He's also the subject of that sentence. My ball is in the trunk. In is a preposition. You got it. All right. I cannot see for the fog. See is an action word. It's a verb, right? Good. Clara and John are dating. And is... A conjunction, and it is a coordinating conjunction. Since the 4th of July, I haven't eaten a hot dog. Which since? It's also a conjunction, but it's a subordinating conjunction because it connects the 4th of July, which is not a clause, it's a phrase, with the clause, I haven't eaten a hot dog. So you got a clause joined to a, a phrase, and so the, the conjunction is a subordinating conjunction, since. All right. I am extremely tired. What is extremely? It is an adverb, right? An adverb. Boy, I am hungry. Boy is? No, it's not a noun. <laughs> That's right. It's an interjection. And then finally, whose red car is this? Whose? This is the hard one. Think about it for a second. An interrogative pronoun. If you got that, pat yourself on the back. You are awesome. If you didn't get it, no worries. You're still awesome. Uh, you'll get it next time. All right. Final thing is this daily writing tips website. I, you know, I didn't check this link. Uh, I usually check it. But I forgot to check it today before I started this video. But uh, check it out. Uh, it's probably still good. Uh, it gives you great writing tips and grammar tips. Uh, syntax tips, things, all the stuff we just covered. It'll tell you so much more about it. So if you have any questions about anything we covered, maybe go to this site first, look it up, read what they have to say. If you still have questions, give me a call, write me, whatever. I am here to help you in any way I can. All right? Whew. All right. <clears throat> My mouth is dry. 
Your ears are probably dry at this point, aren't they? You're ready for me to be quiet so you can get on with the rest of your assignments for this week. But uh, again, I just want to say thank you for being a part of my class. I'm looking forward to what we're going to do this semester. Um, I really want to help you in any way that I can. Questions that go unanswered are the only stupid questions in the world. There is no stupid question. If you ask a question, it is not stupid. Again, the only stupid question is the one that just never gets asked and answered. I'm here to help. Uh, you, again, go to the syllabus. You can find my phone number or email address. The only thing I'd say about my phone number is it's my personal phone number, so don't abuse that number. Uh, please don't call me at 3 o'clock in the morning or, you know, um, at dinner time, those types of things. If you want to call me during the day or early evening or whatever, by all means, uh, give me a buzz. But just, you know, obviously use common sense when you're using that phone number. That's all that I ask. All right, folks, I'm going to get off of here, and uh, I will talk to you again next week if I don't talk to you between now and then. Great having you in class. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.